Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It was the day when the Passover lambs were to be killed and eaten. Families gathered together to eat the Passover meal, just as pious Jews continue to do to this day. The 12 disciples and Jesus had become a family. Jesus made the arrangements for this meal with a man in the city of Jerusalem. He sent two of his disciples ahead to make the preparations for the meal. They would find the room by following a man carrying a water jar. The whole thing sounds a bit mysterious, maybe even a little strange. He could have just given them the address and described the house that he had in mind. But Jesus seems determined that no one should know where to find him on this night. At least, not yet. Judas had already made his deal with the Sanhedrin to betray him, and Jesus was aware of it. But Jesus still had more to say and to do with his disciples, and he didn't want to take the risk of being interrupted by temple guards in the middle of the supper. And so he sent Peter and John ahead to make the preparations, but not Judas. Judas would not know ahead of time where this meal would take place. Jesus leads his disciples into the city. They enter the house. The doors are shut. They were all alone. There was not even the usual servant present to wash the dust off their feet. Instead, there was a jar of water, a basin, and a towel left at the entrance to the upstairs room. Try to picture it in your mind's eye. As they enter the room, each one sees the pitcher and the bowl and the towel. Each one tries to pretend that they don't see it. Which one? Which one of them would volunteer to wash the feet? Jesus waits to see who will be the servant to the others. Had any of them understood anything at all of what he had been teaching them now for three years? He realizes None of them had learned anything. After three years, they remained pretty much unchanged. Still infected with pride. Which one of us will be the greatest? Still too worried that they might be taken advantage of by others. Why doesn't he do it? No one willing to love his neighbor let alone his brother, enough to be his servant. No, not one. The dinner is ready. He invites them all to recline at the table. The reclining position puts one's feet exceptionally close to the neighbor's face. This is the reason why washed feet are so important. And yet still, no one is willing to do what needs to be done. No, not one. So Jesus gets up from the table. He takes off his outer garments, takes the towel, pours the water in the basin, gets down on his knees, and he begins to wash the disciples' feet, and then to wipe them dry, one at a time, 24 times. Picture this. Try to picture this if you can. Jesus Christ, the very God of very God, by whom all things were made, apart from whom nothing was made that has been made, at whose command, the stormy sea becomes calm. Who walks on the water, who casts out the demons, who heals the diseases, 
who raises the widow's dead son and the sister's dead brother, of whom all of the demons in hell shudder and all of the angels in heaven bend in adoring praise. This one, this one, gets down on his hands and his knees and does the work of the lowliest slave. This is something that every one of the 12 in that room felt. They were too important, too dignified to do. When he had moved around the entire table and finished washing all 24 feet, he put his outer garments back on and resumed his place. And then he asks them this question. Do you understand what I have done for you? The purpose of the question seems obvious, doesn't it? If they understand what he has done for them, then, then they should be willing to humble themselves and do likewise for one another. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. This is what St. Paul had in mind when he wrote to the Philippians, just as we heard on Sunday, Palm Sunday. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant. Do you understand what I have done for you? Well, do you? Isn't our entire life a response to what Jesus Christ has done for us? He set aside the divine majesty that is rightfully his, and he became a servant to us. He is all in all, but he made himself to be nothing so that we might be something. He laid down his life in order to raise ours up. This is love, says John, who owned two of those 24 feet Jesus washed on that holy night. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. And then John directs us to the only logical response that there is to this kind of love. Dear friend, since God so loved us, we ought to love one another. To love one another. That is to be our response to God's love in Christ for you. To serve one another is the proper response to the divine service that we receive from Christ. Love is more than just sentimental feelings and emotions. It's always action. You should do as I have done for you. When we love the one whom God loves, we are actually showing our love for God. This is Monday, Thursday, the night when Christians commemorate the institution of the Lord's Supper. This is the night when the Passover became what it had always been destined to become since Moses instituted it in Egypt. This is the night when Jesus replaced the Passover lamb with his own body and his own blood. Do we understand what Jesus does for us in this sacrament? He gives us his true body and his true blood for the forgiveness of our sins and the renewing and strengthening of our faith. As we eat his body and drink his blood, we are reminded and reassured that he is truly present with us just as he promised he would be 
I will be with you always, not just in spirit, but also in the flesh. But this is not all that Jesus instituted by this sacrament. We do not fully grasp what Jesus has done for us here in this supper unless we understand what he has done for us by washing the disciples' feet. This is not a separate incident, unrelated or disconnected from the Lord's Supper itself. John tells us that it was during the supper that he got up and washed their feet. In fact, John doesn't even include the words of institution in his account of the Lord's Supper. He only includes the washing of the disciples' feet. Instead of words of institution, John records Jesus saying, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you. And it is from this that this night gets its name, Maundy Thursday, Mandatum Thursday, Commandment Thursday, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you. The point is this. By washing the disciples' feet as part and parcel of the Lord's Supper, Jesus permanently embeds this mandate into the Supper every time it is celebrated. It is not that we must get out the basin and the towel and literally wash one another's feet. He does not say, take and wash take and dry. If he did, we'd most certainly do this. But no, this is an example. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Actually, this whole matter of loving our neighbor is no new commandment at all. The summary of the second table of the Ten Commandments has always been that we are to love our neighbor as ourselves. What is new here is that Jesus makes loving one another part and parcel of our participation in the Lord's Supper. Here in this Supper, Jesus gives us his love with which we are to love one another. He gives us his forgiveness with which we are to forgive one another. Here in this supper, Christ gives himself to us so that we may give ourselves to one another. And because this bread and this wine is the very body and blood of Jesus Christ, as we give to others what we have received from him, we are in essence giving one another Jesus Christ. We give one another Christ whose body we have received and whose body we are, for we are the body of Christ. Do you understand what I have done for you? Well, do you? If so, then we cannot walk away from this meal where we have received Christ's crucified flesh and shed blood and continue to talk in vague generalities about loving one another. We simply cannot come to this table of the Lord to receive the full forgiveness for all of our sins and then refuse to forgive one another and continue to hold a grudge. We cannot receive the healing and renewal that Christ gives to us in this sacrament and continually and willfully harm one another. Do you understand what I have done for you? Well, do you? If so, we can walk away from this meal relieved of the burdens and the heavy loads that we have been carrying and that so weigh us down. We can come to this table 
fully expecting that the holy food will change us and transform our self-centered heart into a servant's heart. We can receive the healing and renewal that Christ gives to us in this sacrament and continue to intentionally love one another. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. Amen.